Yes, welcome to the webinar on patient-centered outcomes research and the use of decision aids to facilitate shared decision making. I think we have a great group of uh, panelists to talk about uh, various experiences in the context of decision making. We have Joanne Chanin from Patient-Centered Medical Home and Neighborhood, Victor Monturi from Mayo Clinic, and Elena Fournier from HRQ. Uh, the continuing education activity is managed and accredited by PESG, and uh, there are no um, and conflicts of interest to disclose for this activity. The specific learning objectives for this activity are uh, to define patient-centered care and shared decision-making and current NCQA requirements for patient-centered medical homes and accountable care organizations uh, to be able to describe the attributes uh, and advantages of patient-centered outcomes research and decision aids in augmenting patient-centered care in the context of shared decision-making and to identify HRQ as a key resource of patient-centered outcomes research and shared decision-making materials. So just to set the bar um, at the beginning and just take a few minutes before we get into the great presentations uh, around the shared decision-making context, the background around this is a lot of the key seminal work around shared decision-making was published in the late 90s and really crossing the quality chasm published by the Institute of Medicine in 2001 called for a system that provides care that is respectful to individual patient preferences, needs, and values and ensuring that patient values guide all clinical decisions. So that really started the current shared decision move, uh, making movement and a lot of interest broadly uh, in uh, introducing shared decision making into clinical practices. This was further enhanced by the language in the Affordable Care Act, which called for new shared decision-making resource centers in Section 3506 to help integrate shared decision-making into practice. While this was called for, it was not necessarily funded, but also Section 3021, which called to examine how support tools can be used to improve patient understanding of their treatment options. And further, there was the formation of Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, or PCORI, to really sort of uh, generate patient-centered outcomes that can be used uh, to guide decision-making uh, for patients and other stakeholders. Now, prior to this, one of the key components was sort of in the Recovery Act in uh, 2009, there was real focus on comparative effectiveness research, which was uh, described as being able to provide comparative effectiveness information to assist patients, clinicians, purchasers, and policymakers in making informed health decisions. And here you can see in the chart uh, below, published by Benner et al. in 2010, that a bulk of the funding was focused on evidence development and synthesis, as well as infrastructure and methods development, with relatively little funding uh, on translation and dissemination of this evidence or stakeholder engagement. And as a result, you can see in this table a series of trials, uh, key trials um, that um, were uh, focused on this publication by Timby in 2012 that had a relatively little impact on translating the results of these trials into practice. And specifically, they looked at um, Timby et al. as well as Murata et al. looked at sort of why this might be the case. And this was from looking at misalignment of financial incentives, complexity of research biases and interpretation of results, applicability of the evidence, as well as limited use of decision support as some of the key reasons why these results were not being translated into routine clinical practice. So when you think about the comparative effectiveness research movement that started, and really oftentimes this is also known as the patient-centered outcomes research, how do we get that into decision aids or decision support tools that can help create a conversation and, and specifically focus on translating the evidence that's, that's generated through the comparative effectiveness research while engaging patients in their care? And so, so one of the key pieces here is how, do you, how does this fit into the patient-centered medical home and accountable care organizations that are really getting a lot of focus uh, as, um, as one of the key changes in healthcare delivery. So to that end, Joanne Chanin um, from Patient-Centered Medical Home and Neighborhood uh, will give you an overview of how this fits into the broader Patient-Centered Medical Home uh, movement. So Joanne Chanin has more than 10 years of experience with the medical home model and care coordination with the healthcare neighborhood. She led the development of evaluation programs for both primary care and specialty care practices while employed at National Committee for Quality Assurance. She's conducted extensive research on shared decision-making tools and implementation practices and is considered an expert on medical home model. 
Ms. Chainin earned a Bachelor of Science and Master of Science in Nursing at the University of Michigan and has worked at a, as a hospital-based clinical nurse specialist and a healthcare researcher at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. Um, welcome, Joanne, um, and I will let you take it from here. Thanks so much. Thank you, Neelay. Um, it's a pleasure to be here to talk about something about which I feel very passionate, which is um, enabling patient choice in the patient-centered medical home. And um, what I will talk about during my presentation is to give you a little bit of background about the National Committee for Quality Assurance, NCQA, because the um, standards that I'll be discussing um, were developed by the National Committee for Quality Assurance. Give you a little bit of information about patient-centered care and how this links to um, the standards, both the medical home standards and the accountable care standards. Um, NCQA's um, definition of shared decision making, and then a little bit about um, our, the NCQA's requirements for medical home for the patient-centered specialty practice, which is a companion set of standards um, that were developed by, the, by NCQA, and both fit very nicely into the accreditation program for accountable care organization. The National Committee for Quality Assurance um, is celebrating its 25th anniversary this year, and it got its start by developing standards for health plans. So they, in the, um, one of the hallmarks of the NCQA standards and approach, approach to measurement is by um, using transparency, by having standards against which an organization or a practice is evaluated, and then holding that entity accountable. Um, the provider-based quality programs that um, NCQA currently has, um, that um, entrance into the type of uh, evaluation that they do began in the late 1990s. So it was a little bit later than the health plan um, programs when they began to be developed. And the accountable care organization, so ACOs, there are two provider-focused programs that evaluate the care that individual providers give to patients with diabetes and then a second one um, with heart stroke. The, the third bullet that you see, um, the patient-centered medical home and patient-centered specialty practice standards um, are based on a, a systems approach, um, and we'll talk about that um, in just a few minutes. So shared decision-making. Um, what does shared decision-making mean in the context of a, of a medical home? Well, the, the purpose of shared decision-making, as you um, may be well aware, is to provide patients with information that they can use to make informed decisions, to take into account what the patient's values are, and to engage in a, in a dialogue with the care team to make the best decisions for that patient. Oftentimes, the shared decision-making approach is used when there is no best choice, so preference-sensitive um, decisions. And this process takes into consideration evidence. So um, Neele talked about um, evidence a little bit earlier. So using evidence um, to support the, the, um, what patients use in making their health care decision. Um, having the um, information 
include both the benefits and the harms of, of each of the options that the patient may be um, considering. And the provider's knowledge and experience certainly come into play um, in their conversation with the patient. And most definitely, patients' values and preference um, are integral to the shared decision-making process. Um, of course, um, as a caveat, not every single decision um, that's made by a healthcare team that includes the patient needs to be a shared decision. So, for example, surgery for acute appendicitis is perhaps not something that uh, patients will engage in a long discussion about or repairing a compound fracture. So how does, um, just as, as background, before we talk about the, in, the integration of shared decision-making into the patient-centered medical home, um, what is a patient-centered medical home? Well, it's the provision of care um, that patients really want. So it's care that's provided as the patient wants it to be. It's whole person care, it's coordinated. Um, by whole person, it means that it's not just looking at a chronic condition or acute care, um, it's looking at uh, the provision of care that's preventive, chronic, acute, um, over the patient's lifetime. Um, it, the care is um, where there is um, the patient having a relationship with a clinician and both the patient and the um, practice work to keep the patient healthy between visits. So um, that preventive care component. And it's a team-based approach. So it's not just the clinician working with the patient, but it's a team of people within the practice um, and it's enabling um, individuals within the practice and on the practice team functioning at their, their highest level of training. Um, information technology um, can be used very effectively to support the triple aim. So that's Don Berwick's um, Triple aim, meaning um, an emphasis on quality of care, um, cost-effective care, and care that considers the, the patient's um, experience. What you see on this slide is a summary of, the, um, of NCQA's patient-centered medical home standards. Um, I'm going to um, cover just brief highlights about this set of standards, but um, if anyone is interested in additional information, it is certainly available and you can contact me or go to the NCQA website. Um, it underscores the importance of patients having appointment access and their um, the practice having a triage system for determining how quickly patients need to be seen. 24-hour access to clinical advice. As, as you may um, think about this, to help prevent patients from needing to go to the emergency room um, and allaying patient concerns. Electronic access. Team-based care, we've talked a little bit about, but making sure that the care that's provided is culturally and linguistically appropriate for the practice's patients. Um, using patient information, so collecting and using patient information, both demographic and clinical information, to guide um, um, the management of patient populations, so identifying populations of patients that may need um, reminders or follow-up care. Identifying patients who are 
high risk, complex, and attending to their their needs and providing good individual um, care management, um, medication management, self care support. And this is where uh, shared decision making comes into play in a in a very big way. Um, tracking, test tracking, referral tracking, following and following up to ensure that the results come back to the practice and that care is coordinated um, across the spectrum of of health care. So those transitions of care, hospital, um, back to the practice, um, hopefully few emergency room visits, but should a patient go into the emergency room, ensuring that there's good information exchange between the practice and um, the emergency room. And then continuous quality improvement. So evaluating um, clinical performance, uh, resource use, so being attentive to cost effectiveness and the patient experience, using those as tools to engage in continuous quality improvement. So where does um, shared decision making fit into the medical home program? Well, identifying patients um, and using evidence-based guidelines to manage populations of patients. So having registries and the sharing of decision-making would come into play when the patient, when it is suggested that the patient come in for, um, for a follow-up or for a preventive care uh, test, follow-up with um, chronic care management. Certainly, as it relates to individual patient care, so establishing a, a care plan, managing medications, looking at choices when it comes to self-care. So shared decision-making and good communication between the patient and the practice is, is really crucial here. And within the patient experience surveys, so the medical home CAP survey includes shared decision-making items. And so this provides the practice with additional information and the patient a voice in how the practice is managing their care. I mentioned that the patient-centered specialty practice is a companion piece to um, the patient-centered medical home and it was developed in it with that in mind. So there are many similarities, but the standards for this program target what, what can be done um, and accomplished um, at the specialty practice level. Um, timely access to appointments, establishing agreements between primary care and um, the medical home so that there is timely information exchange between primary care with their sending a referral and the um, specialty practice in providing a summary back to primary care. Coordinating care, communication, um, and certainly there's an emphasis in this set of standards on reducing hospitalization, ED visits, and duplication of, of tests. Performance measurement is a hallmark of NCQA's programs, and this um, set of standards is no exception. Both the medical home um, standards and this set of standards align with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid um, meaningful use requirements. Um, Shared decision-making, um, as you might expect, is embedded in this set of standards as well. So the coordination with primary care um, and the information exchange, incorporating um, the patient in all of the decisions 
um, related to care plan development, care management, self-care, and then um, there is a component um, for evaluating patient experience. So that is part of the um, continuous quality improvement that is um, part of this program as well. The accountable care set of standards, um, NCQA standards, are based on the patient-centered medical home set of standards, so they are foundational to the um, ACO standards. And as you may know, um, the accountable care organizations are provider um, organizations that may be hospital-based or may be practice-based, but the organization um, as an ACO is held accountable for the quality of care and the cost of care, and they've got a defined population. Um, so the standards are um, not far afield of what the patient-centered medical home standards are, but they are broader in concept. And it focuses on access, operations, um, having providing primary care um, to the, the patients that they are um, held responsible for coordination, um, and shared decision-making is a part of actually, um, it's part of the program operations, um, but it's, it really emphasizes shared decision-making um, and the use of shared decision-making aids. Um, so using evidence-based guidelines and decision support tools um, and reporting on patient experience and then the decision support aids, ensuring that they're available to the providers that practice within this ACO. A shared decision-making for purposes of the programs that, um, that I have just briefly um, reviewed with you, um, in the opinion of, um, in my opinion, and in the way the programs are structured, shared decision making is vital. It helps ensure that the care that's provided has a patient-centered focus. It encourages and supports um, patients being involved in the development of their care plan, in how care is managed, and what they um, perform at home. And, and um, they're asked about their patient experience, and shared decision-making supports the, the experience the patient has. It most certainly contains, helps contain costs. So avoiding duplication of services um, and supporting the improved coordination of care. And above all, it improves the quality of patient care. With, I want to leave you with um, something that was in Health Affairs um, in 2013. Implementing shared decision making will help organizations to achieve the triple aim of better care, better help, and lower costs. And with that, I will be turning this over to Victor Montori. And thank you so much for the privilege of being able to talk about this. Well, hello. This is Victor Montori. So um, I guess I'm next. I'm going to be. Um, um, be talking about um, a specific experience of shared decision making uh, and particularly the research experience work that we've done here at Mayo Clinic. On this first slide is my Twitter um, uh, handle as well as my email address and so you should feel free to 
the, the Twitter handle at any time and the email address if you were to have any questions after the session is over and your question didn't get the result, I'm happy to address those. I have no disclosures. A um, number of justifications have been mentioned already for shared decision making. Um, one that uh, Dr. Shah, who is the facilitator of this session, uh, contributed to is um, uh, refer refers to the uh, mall distribution geographically of, um, of decisions. Uh, and I say it's mall distribution because um, this map of the United States that shows the adoption of a particular diabetes drug, rosiglitazone, despite the evidence uh, in the systematic review of comparative effectiveness that suggests no specific uh, advantages of it, cannot reflect that differences in values and preferences across state lines, but rather differences in other people's values and preferences, which suggests that you get the care that you get because of where you live. And that uh, may not be what patients would expect from the healthcare system. Um, the other justification for shared decision making that has been implied is one related to patient safety. And we are very concerned when patients get the wrong treatment uh, because we give it to the wrong person or somebody we believe they have the wrong diagnosis or that they get the wrong procedure, we amputate the wrong leg. But we usually don't get too excited about the possibility of having given the patient a treatment that they would not have chosen if they knew what we know. So this idea of misdiagnosing preferences represents another justification for shared decision making. The justification that got our group into this um, uh, comes from understanding what evidence-based medicine is. And evidence-based medicine has two fundamental principles. The first one is that the better the body of the more uh, high, higher quality in the body of evidence, the more confident the decision will be. But the second principle, which is often ignored, is that the evidence alone from clinical research does not fully inform a decision. You have to also take into account the patient's context as well as the patient's values and preferences. Uh, clinicians are no longer um, able to um, imagine context and values and preferences uh, with any kind of credibility. As, uh, for instance, one example is that the, there are differences in culture, education, and also socioeconomic differences that are increasing between patients and clinicians. So it's better to engage the expert in those matters when you're making a decision, and that expert is uh, the patient. Another justification for shared decision making comes in this graph that shows the, the uh, translation of evidence into practice. Um, the triangle on the left uh, shows the, the uh, evidence production machine with the uh, tip uh, of that triangle representing, representing the only evidence that uh, people need to know about. And then the process from left to right in those boxes of the loss of voltage, so to speak, of that evidence as it gets translated into practice, with people becoming aware but not fully of the evidence, accepting it and finding applicable in their practice. Then the quality improvement activities that uh, seek to find that ev the application of that evidence uh, feasible by the clinicians then feeling able to apply that evidence and acting on that evidence uh, when the patient that needs the intervention is, um, is identified properly. But um, if the quality improvement activities uh, finish at the um, front door of the hospital, then uh, one will not see the impact of this translation in full, uh, particularly for interventions that require uh, patients uh, to uh, adhere to treatments over time. So uh, this last uh, bit, you know, getting patients on board with the treatment program is another justification for shared decision making. There are other justifications that are of the policy uh, uh, domain, such as the uh, uh, movement towards uh, uh, meaningful use of uh, uh, health information technology. And in the stage three uh, meaningful use, there is mention of using uh, health information technology for in support of shared decision making. At the end of the day, our group believes that the reason to do shared decision making is because it is the right thing to do for patients, particularly in relation to this notion that um, what you, um, uh, that patients are the ones that are going to experience the consequences of these decisions. And it's uh, just fair for them to know that options are available and that they can um, uh, decide from them. Now, what, how what might we uh, do share decision making? Well, here is a, a series of uh, models of decision making that are available in the medical literature. The more uh, classic one is on the left, the parental or paternalistic model, in which the uh, uh, options are shared with patients with enough detail to obtain the uh, legal minimum for informed consent. Most of the deliberation across the options is, um, takes place in the clinician's head, and the final decision is manifested as in the form of clinician orders. Obviously, the clinician in this case has no chance of accessing the values and preference and context of the patient, and as a result, um, uh, cannot um, then practice evidence-based medicine. Um, the other three choices involve a sharing of information about the options between the clinician and the patient, 
And what differs across them is who is primarily responsible for driving the deliberation across the options and making the final decision. Um, shared decision making is uh, situated um, theoretically in the middle of this with a uh, balanced participation of patient and clinician in deciding about the options, in deliberating jointly, and in reaching a decision by consensus. Uh, but this is an ideal. It's, a, it's, a, it's an imaginary situation. It's a, it's a unicorn. Um, so what we promote is the idea of empathic decision making, which is the, the notion that clinicians um, do the heavy lifting and uh, figure out for this patient, for this decision at this time, which is the ideal model uh, for uh, engaging patients uh, in decision making to the maximum extent that the patient can and is willing and would like to do and prefer to do. And so this uh, requires, therefore, a partnership. It requires dancing across the models and requires uh, significant support for the process of deliberation, which in the case of evidence-based practice requires uh, accessing uh, the evidence. What do we know about shared decision making? Well, we, what we know has been recently summarized in the Cochrane Systematic Review um, that involves 115 randomized trials that compare usual care with uh, decision aids, most of which were used by patients exclusively in preparation for a decision making visit. Um, you can see the outcomes on this slide, including the addition of three minutes of time during the consultation, the reduction in the undecided group, but most importantly, which is something that somehow has failed to penetrate the uh, minds of people that are involved in shared decision making is that shared decision making, according to this evidence, has not been able to have a consistent effect on choice, on adherence, on health outcomes, or on healthcare costs. Now, um, I want to make the point that this uh, evidence, for, for the most part, describes shared decision making tools that are used by the patient. So this is really a sophisticated form of patient education rather than shared decision-making support uh, during the point where patients and clinicians are sharing decisions together or making decisions together. The first effort our team uh, made was in 2005 and uh, involved the decision of taking statins uh, to support cardiovascular or primary prevention of cardiovascular events. And this particular tool has a feature that was uh, interesting, which is the communication of risk using best practices for that purpose. And um, one of the things that, uh, that uh, you see in this slide is that um, at the top, there is a panel uh, that shows the risk uh, in a patient, or the patient that we just produced this for, um, the risk in 100 patients like her uh, for in the next uh, 10 years to have a heart attack. And so the way we would describe this to say Mrs. Jones is, Mrs. Jones, you're in a room with 100 people just like you. We're gonna close the door and 10 years later, we're gonna open the door and we're gonna count. And we're gonna find that 80 people like you will not have had a heart attack here described in green, and 20 people in red here would have had a heart attack. I do not know, Mrs. Jones, if you're one of the red ones or one of the green ones. If we give uh, the statins to all 100 people like you and close the door, open it 10 years later and count again, we will see that these uh, green people, uh, these 80 people that were not destined to have a heart attack would have taken the medicine and would have experienced no benefit. Uh, 15 in red here, 15 of the 20 people that were at risk of a heart attack would have experienced a heart attack despite taking the medicine regularly. And five people here in yellow would have avoided the heart attack because they took the medicine. Again, Mrs. Jones, I do not know if you're one of the green ones, one of the red ones, or one of the yellow ones. This and, uh, uh, Dr. Shah at the beginning talked about creating a conversation. Well, this created a conversation because the usual interaction was, Mrs. Jones, uh, you have diabetes, your risk is high, you're a ticking time bomb, you're going to get a heart attack, your cholesterol is too high, it's 101 milligrams per deciliter. According to the guidelines, it should be under 100 milligrams per deciliter, so we're going to prescribe you 10 milligrams of atorvastatin. In three months, we'll check your cholesterol again, and if it's not under 100 milligrams per deciliter, or ideally under 70 milligrams per deciliter, we'll increase the dose of um, uh, statins until we can make your cholesterol completely undetectable in your bloodstream. And when patients will, will hear that, they will think that this cholesterol lowering is a very highly technical decision. But this tool allowed uh, patients like Mrs. Jones to uh, consider whether this reduction in risk, as described here, is sufficient to justify taking a pill, uh, which for most of these patients will be for the rest of their lives. Um, what, was the, um, what was the outcome of this work? Well, we did a randomized trial and we found that patients that received this kind of support were 22 times more likely to have an accurate sense of their risk. There were 70% fewer prescriptions in the lower risk group. I failed to mention that this trial was done exclusively in patients with type 2 diabetes, which the guidelines at the time considered uh, as equivalent to having had a heart attack. 
And so these clinicians who used the tool in the, in the intervention arm and that um, ended up prescribing uh, less statins um, uh, in, uh, the, um, the fewer, in fewer instances in the intervention arm in the lower risk group um, were in a particularly funny position because from a quality perspective, they looked like they were not following the guidelines. But from a patient-centered perspective, they were in the most patient-centered uh, group. And because the tool was evidence-based, in fact, they were also the most evidence-based group. So who wins? Uh, we also noticed a threefold increase in self-reported adherence to statins, but uh, as we have, I will show you later, this has not pan out when we've used more robust measures of adherence. We also notice uh, this in the top left is the interaction between patient and clinician with the tool. Without the tool, in the bottom right is the interaction of the same clinician, the same room, different patient with the tool. And you can see a very different uh, uh, form of communication and conversation uh, created by the tool, um, which uh, I, I think is important in generating a therapeutic alliance uh, critical for chronic disease. For diabetes um, medications, we used a different approach. We thought patients could choose their diabetes medicine. Guidelines, and uh, particularly by uh, the uh, specialty societies, required diabetologists to um, guide the decision of which diabetes medicine was necessary on the basis of complex pathophysiologic criteria. Uh, we thought that was ridiculous. Most of these medicines um, don't differ in their ability to reduce cardio uh, uh, diabetes complications, and we could just uh, figure out what is best for you uh, by uh, in comparing the downsides and inconveniences associated with these medicines. The way this will work is as follows. We would ask the patient, say the patient was on metformin, and we would say to the patient, which aspect of your next diabetes medicine would you like to discuss next or would you like to discuss first? And so the patient will look at the titles of the cards, and the most uh, popular card that they will pick first will be the weight change card. And we will give this card to the patient. The patient will look at this card and learn how the different diabetes agents affect their weight. Um, in our randomized trial of this particular intervention, what was, one of the things that was striking is that this discussion, how the medicines affect patients' weight, never took place in the control arm. But it was the most popular discussion patients wanted to have in the intervention arm. So a patient might look at this and decide that it's interesting that there will be a couple of options that will help them lose weight. So then the question uh, for the patient is, well, what aspect of those medicines would you like to learn about next? And so many patients would choose, well, how do you take this medicine? And, and uh, they will pick the daily routine card. And they will learn that for relaglutide, it is an injectable medicine. And uh, for this other kind of medicine, it's a, it's a pill. Some patients with the, with the uh, promise of losing weight will be willing to inject their eyeballs. But most patients will try to avoid the inconvenience of injection and maybe be interested in this particular tablet. And we will say, well, what aspect of that medicine would you like uh, to learn about next? And often patients will be interested in learning about the out-of-pocket cost implications of this medicine. And here they will learn that, for instance, the metformin they were taking is 10 cents a day. But this new uh, uh, drug class will cost them 6 7 $8 a day. Well, and the patients might logically ask, doctor, is this drug you know, 80 times better than what I'm taking right now. And of course, no, it's just that the drug company is 80 times greedier. And so uh, they might look back at the, at the medicines and they say, well, maybe this one that I didn't want to inject myself, maybe it's cheaper, and of course it's not. Then they might go back and say, well, what is it that I can afford here? Or maybe look at the weight neutral, maybe I can afford weight neutral. And of course, no, they can't. Uh, and they may want to look at maybe a little bit of weight gain with a sulfonylurea. Well, that's one tablet a day. I'm, I'm all for it. And it's also 10 cents a day. So they might arrive, if they were cost sensitive, they might arrive at this choice. But you can easily imagine a patient that might um, uh, not be as cost sensitive and might be able to choose any of the other different drugs. At the end of the day, when we did the randomized drug, we were able to show the patients were able, completely able to participate in deciding that that is drug that, were, uh, that was best for them. Not only that, but we've also reproduced this experience in depression. And this was a project that was funded um, by AHRQ as part of the um, IADAPT uh, grant request, part of the uh, um, Recovery Act that Neelay mentioned at the top. And uh, the results have been in, uh, very interesting, and they have been, uh, are being submitted for publication this week. Um, the, uh, 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 what we see here is, our, is the main results. Uh, patients and clinicians uh, uh, were reporting high degree of confidence about their choice, and what's in parentheses is the p-value difference between that and the control arm. Um, the knowledge about the options was 12% better. The satisfaction with the process was 35% better. 
Um, in terms of the video analysis of the encounters, we found that patient involvement in decision making was 40% greater in the intervention arm. And in terms of um, involving the uh, patient voices in the preferences, um, the second uh, number here is, describes the uh, decision aid arm. 92% versus 70 were able to, the, the preferences, were, the, the, when the, a preference was voiced, it was the patient that voiced the preference. Um, a, a clinician voicing the preference was 95% of the time. Uh, so it's not that clinicians were quiet uh, when it, it was really both of them participating actively. And in terms of identifying who, who, who called the shots as to which was the most important issue in choosing antidepressants, um, the uh, patient identified the top issue 63% of the time with a decision in, so it was not every time, but it was zero in the control arm. In terms of fidelity with the intended use of these cards, about half of the time, um, the cards were used properly, and this is without any training of the clinicians in their use. So in terms of their uh, ability to be deployed fairly quickly in practices, this um, was very positive. In, like everything else that I've discussed in shared decision-making, the ability to involve patients in, in, in choice um, not only did not uh, affect adherence, but I think importantly, uh, not, did not have a negative effect on their uh, depression control, but also did not have a positive effect on their depression control. There are, just like we have risk communication tools like the statin one and issue tools like the diabetes cards, we have this um, combined uh, tool in which the uh, risk communication is given for strokes with and without anticoagulation, but the choice of anticoagulation is made on the basis of the issues that matter to patients the most, just like we saw with the diabetes and depression cards. So we, we continue to try to innovate different approaches here all these uh, tools, by the way, are freely available. They can be downloaded when they're electronic. The electronic tools can be used or implemented within electronic medical records, and those are available in the website that I'll um, uh, show at the end, um, and can be used by anyone on this call at any time. Um, the summary of this experience is that uh, we've been able to uncover a number of, um, a number of uh, statements of fact in shared decision-making, which turned out to be myths. So the first myth was that shared decision-making is for young people. You can see the age distribution of our experience, um, and I can tell you that we cannot distinguish the outcomes by age. Um, we were told that this only would happen if there's enough time for it, and so maybe somebody in specialty care will be able to do it. Well, almost all of our experience has been in primary care. Um, we've also had experience in the emergency department, no problem. Uh, as long as you define the tools for use uh, in that particular context, you can make them work, um, and they work very efficiently. Uh, we noted that we can add also three minutes to the consultation, which is similar to what is added when the tool is distributed outside the consultation, as in the patient education material. Uh, we can get uh, fidelity without training uh, of the range between 50 and 60 percent, which uh, bodes well for implementation. We get the same levels of improvement and engagement as uh, other uh, investigators. Um, and very importantly, we get similar effects in outcomes in patients uh, that uh, belong to vulnerable populations versus everyone else, suggesting that these tools might uh, be working as an equalizer. And again, I, I can't emphasize this enough, we see variable effects on clinical outcomes, including adherence, and, and variable effects on healthcare utilization and costs. Uh, in terms of implementation, we are using low-tech uh, material for training. I mentioned that in general we don't do training, but sometimes we um, distribute this cartoon, uh, we do demos, um, and then we're also, for implementation, we're integrating this into the electronic workflow, uh, working very hard with um, uh, big vendors without any exclusivity agreement so that everybody can play with the tools. This is for the staffing tool. Make sure that we have an EMR link that pre-populates it with information about this patient, and then a documentation link that will allow, uh, for instance, organizations that are interested in getting credit for shared decision-making, for perhaps participating in an ACO program or a, or a, medical, uh, a patient center medical home program, in which they don't want to rely on self-reported shared decision making, which of course has very little validity, but would like to document when it actually happened, this might be an approach that would be uh, uh, of higher integrity. Um, our group is now uh, trying to uh, implement this nationally, and we're using the, the Mayo Clinic Care Network, which is 32 sites across the United States, in the largest test of point of care shared decision making ever, and uh, it's uh, a lot of uh, work, and, uh, uh, Dr. Lepini is leading that work, um, and uh, we, we are uh, making early progress, progress that is uh, predicated on lessons learned in a AHRQ-funded R24 program uh, uh, lead, led by um, 
uh, Dr. Annie LeBlanc, who is um, uh, a pioneer in implementing shared decision making in the practice. In the meantime, this, all these efforts of, of uh, explicit uh, and uh, dedicated uh, dissemination work, uh, there is diffusion of these tools. I mentioned they're, they're freely available. It's always exciting to see that uh, people are taking advantage of them. Um, the numbers here have been updated, and for the year 2014, 100,000 uh, uses of the shared decision-making tool for statins took place around the world with the exception of Western Africa and Greenland. Everyone else seems to have been on, uh, in on the party. Um, in the United States, the distribution of use um, uh, highlights Wisconsin and, and uh, Minnesota. Minnesota, of course, is where we are. Um, uh, so close to home, we're getting some success. And the, the other places where there's a lot of uptake, they look a lot like Kaiser Permanente. And then when you look at Minnesota, the big blue dot, that is not Rochester, Minnesota, where Mayo Clinic is, but actually is Duluth, Minnesota for essential health is. So uh, this again proves that uh, one never is successful in their own land. Um, if you want to know more about this work, if you want to download the tools, play with them, use them with your patients, this is the website where you can find this work, both um, a work that has been uh, always funded by nonprofit uh, uh, organizations. Um, we've never taken any for-profit funding. And among them all, uh, we've gotten extremely good support from AHRQ, uh, so it's always a, a pleasure to um, participate in a webinar like this, and I thank you for your attention. I pass this now on to the next speaker. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Elena Fournier, um, and I work in the Office of Communication and Knowledge Transfer at the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. Um, I am. I'm so excited to see all the interest in this topic today, thank, and thank you all for joining us. I work primarily on knowledge transfer projects designed to encourage the use and implementation of ARC's work in practice. And most of my work is focused on disseminating and implementing patient-centered outcomes research. So first of all, I would like to thank um, our moderator, Dr. Neelay Shaw, and our first speaker today, Dr. Joanne Chanin, for really setting the stage and describing the need for shared decision-making and some of the factors that are really driving change toward better patient engagement and healthcare decisions right now. I would also like to thank Dr. Montori for sharing his research with us today that shows how the patient decision aids based on patient-centered outcomes research can positively affect patient knowledge and involvement in their healthcare decisions. And those were really some beautiful patient decision aids, so thank you for sharing those, Dr. Montori. So I will be talking today about ARC's recent efforts to use shared decision-making as a platform for in implementing patient-centered outcomes research, or PCOR, in clinical practice. So first of all, before I get started, I'll note that I do not have any relevant financial relationships to disclose. I know that many of you are very familiar with AHRQ, but for those of you who are not as familiar, AHRQ is a federal agency that is part of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Our mission is to produce and disseminate evidence to make healthcare safer, of higher quality, more accessible, equitable, and affordable. Within our mission is to disseminate patient-centered outcomes research, also known as PCOR. Section 937 of the Affordable Care Act directs ARC to broadly disseminate and create informational tools to help disseminate patient-centered outcomes research findings to physicians, healthcare providers, patients, payers, and policymakers. So what is patient-centered outcomes research? Well, you've also heard it called comparative effectiveness research. PCOR can be applied to a myriad of interventions, including preventative, uh, diagnostic, therapeutic, palliative, or health delivery system interventions. PCOR compares the benefits and harms of these interventions and aims to find out how well interventions work in everyday practice settings. Ideally, PCOR looks at the effectiveness of interventions, considering variables, variables not always tested in clinical trials. These variables may include patients who have multiple conditions, are older or different gender than those included in clinical trials. And as you know, these types of variables can affect how well a treatment works. And more than anything, PCOR focuses on outcomes that matter to patients. 
ARC has been in the business of comparative effectiveness research even before it became known as PCOR with its effective health care program. Under the effective health care program, the evidence-based practice centers conduct systematic reviews and comparative effectiveness reviews of the literature to ask how interventions work in real-world settings. The Eisenberg Center for Clinical Decision Sciences translates those reports into plain language resources for patients and healthcare professionals to support clinical decision making. And we work to disseminate those research products to a variety of audiences um, in a variety of settings. Our ultimate goal is to improve healthcare quality and patient health outcomes through informed decision making. And I've also included the link to the Effective Healthcare Program here for your reference. So many of you have been long-term, long-time users of the Effective Healthcare Program's products. Some of them are pictured here. The Effective Healthcare Program develops a variety of decision support resources that compare available evidence on the effectiveness, benefits, and harms of different treatments and interventions for specific healthcare conditions, and these products are designed to encourage conversations between clinicians and patients. They're available online for viewing and print in PDF format and accessible on mobile devices and smartphones. Effective healthcare products are available for order for little or no cost for ARC, from ARC's publication clearinghouse, and many are also available in Spanish. In the next few slides, I'll tell you a bit more about each one of them. So we have more than 60 clinician research summaries on the Effective Healthcare website. These are brief two to three page summaries that are geared to healthcare professionals and provide concise summaries of in-depth systematic reviews of the literature on healthcare topics suggested by the public. Each one discusses the benefits and risks of different treatments for a particular health condition. They offer the clinical bottom line, highlight the strengths of evidence behind the report's conclusions, and describe gaps in evidence. The clinician research summaries are easy to navigate, download, and share. The clinicians use them and share decision making with patients as resources for quick reference or, um, or review to compare treatment options. The clinician summaries can help provide um, providers convey the benefits and risks of patients um, of the patient's options. You can also find continuing education modules for many of the topics on the Effective Healthcare website. For nearly all of the clinician research summaries, ARC offers a companion consumer summary. Just like the clinician summaries, they compare the risks and benefits of treatment options that are designed specifically for patients and or their caregivers with patient-friendly language, images, and design. The consumer research summaries aim to involve patients and family members in decision making by informing patients and caregivers about their options and helping clarify patients' preferences for risks and benefits of options. The consumer summaries encourage patients and family members to discuss their preferences with their providers and offer a list of questions to ask. And these are available in English, Spanish, and audio formats. Art also develops interactive patient decision aids. Much like the consumer research summaries I just described, these tools aim to involve patients and family members in decision making. However, these are more sophisticated web-based decision support tools that use short videos, tutorials, and animation to walk users through the steps of clarifying their diagnosis and exploring their treatment options. If you have a website or a blog, you can share these decision aids with your patients by downloading the code for the patient decision aid from the Effective Healthcare website and post it, uh, post the button on your own site. So the need for clinical training on shared decision making with evidence-based information materials is essential as the healthcare environment seeks better patient engagement through healthcare transformation initiatives, such as the patient-centered medical homes and accountable care organizations as Joanne described earlier. Patient-centered outcomes research provides evidence to discuss the benefits and harms of treatment options. However, most healthcare providers have not been adequately trained to effectively communicate with patients about evidence behind the available treatment options or to have conversations with patients about their goals, values, and preferences 
in their care to effectively engage patients in shared decision-making, and many don't recognize whether or not they're actually engaging patients in decision-making processes. So we've, here we've identified an opportunity. We have really good evidence-based education materials from the Effective Healthcare Program to help inform decision-making, and the clinicians who know about them really, really like them, but they may not really know the best ways to use them in shared decision-making. So from that opportunity was born an idea for a knowledge transfer project we called the Educating the Educators. We wanted to help clinicians who, who educate their patients about treatment options learn how to use the effective healthcare and PCOR resources in shared decision making. The project was designed to conduct 10 train the trainer workshops per year across the country, and we chose the train the trainer model to help spread in the face of limited funding. We knew a one-day training wouldn't really be enough to get folks to implement their own shared decision-making oh. programs, and we didn't want to leave our trainees high and dry. So in the project design, we also included additional support for our trainees with webinars, technical assistance, and implementing their own training sessions and a learning network. We envisioned a network of shared decision-making champions learning about shared decision-making and sharing it with others at their own organizations and then sharing their experiences with us and other trainees so we could all learn from one another. I will note here that this work is being carried out under contract for ARC by Appia Inc. and subcontractors Academy Health and Lewin Group and Ketchup. We also, um, sorry. We also wanted to make sure that the workshop curriculum and any supporting informational tools and materials that we would be creating under this project would meet the needs of clinicians. The project included a comprehensive formative research effort. We conducted a literature review and a health educator needs assessment, which included a health professional survey, focus groups across multiple health disciplines, and key informant interviews with experts in shared decision making. We also included a technical expert panel that provided input throughout the project. In the literature review, we were interested in current methods and best practices used by healthcare providers to discuss evidence with patients or caregivers and share decision making. We were also interested in the effectiveness of approaches to engage patients in shared decision making the roles of different healthcare disciplines in shared decision making, and barriers or facilitators for both health professionals and patients to shared decision making. We also looked into different training approaches. In our online survey, we asked similar questions. We had over 2,200 health professionals respond over a three to four week period. To get some more detailed information about clinicians' needs, we also conducted focus groups with both treating clinicians, which included doctors, nurses, um, I'm sorry, nurse practitioners, and physician assistants, and non-treating clinicians, which included nurses, case managers, diabetes educators, pharmacists, and health education specialists. We conducted a total of seven virtual focus groups with 58 participants from 27 states. So please let me note here that in order to expedite the formative research and development process, we use something called the OMB Fast Track Clearance Process for our data collection. This type of government clearance process is generally used for government-sponsored data collections to inform product development and to gather customer feedback. Under this type of clearance, we are unable to formally publish our data, but I can generally discuss what we learned and how our formative research process informed our project. Across all of our data collection methods, we identified several common themes to help answer three main questions. Who should we train? What should be included in the training? And how should we train? So for our first question, who do we train? We found that treating clinicians versus non-treating clinicians are more likely to engage in discussions with patients about healthcare options. Treating clinicians identified a key goal of providing technical information about their condition and care options. 
non-treating clinicians, however, identify key goals of assessing patients, um, patients' needs and goals and clarifying their concerns. We also found that most available treating programs target treating clinicians, but we know that there's a growing interest for programs that target interdisciplinary professionals and teams. So from these results, we decided to take, to take a broad approach to our, um, our audience that recognized the complementary roles of the various members of an interdisciplinary healthcare team in supporting a shared decision-making process. We also decided to accredit our workshop for 10 different healthcare disciplines. For our second question, what do we include in the training, we identified several competencies for which health professionals wanted additional training. All types of health professionals we included in our survey and focus groups were interested in better understanding what comparative effectiveness research or patient-centered outcomes research is, and how these types of research results can be used in shared decision-making. They were interested in where to find and how to easily access PCOR information for use in shared decision-making, and how to engage patients in shared decision-making processes and elicit patient preferences. They were interested in learning more about approaches that can be used in a limited time context and finding time to fit in the shared decision-making conversations. And they were also very interested in learning more about cultural competencies. The training clinicians specifically were also interested in learning more about how to communicate technical information about a patient's conditions and options. They were also interested in learning how to better communicate to patients about the harms and benefits of treatment options or competencies in risk communication. From these results, we knew we needed to address the most common barriers to shared decision-making, including time constraints, health literacy and numeracy, cultural issues, in addition to using patient-centered outcomes research results. So for a third question, we really wanted to know, how do we train? We were planning for a one-day train-the-trainer workshop, but we really wanted to make sure that we got the format right and that it would include the right training techniques to help get our messages across. Again, we identified several common themes across our research methods. Folks really like face-to-face -face training, but like web-based training components as well. A learning community to share ideas and promote ongoing learning would also be helpful. And as we noted in the who to train questions, the training should be interdisciplinary. When we asked clinicians about what types of learning techniques worked best for them, they indicated an interest in role playing, case studies, videos, and small, uh, small group breakouts. So this really helped inform the way that we built our training modules. So after our formative research phase, we developed a streamlined five-step approach to shared decision making that synthesizes the essential elements of shared decision making identified in a systematic review of the, of the literature by McCool and Clayman, published in 2006. We call it the SHARE approach, the, the essential steps to shared decision making. The SHARE, SHARE approach focuses on exploring and comparing benefits, harms, and risks of each healthcare option through meaningful dialogue about what matters most to the patient. We wanted to make it relatively simple and easy to remember. Each step begins with a letter to spell SHARE, a mnemonic aid, to help remember the steps. So step one is to seek your patient's participation. Step two, help your patient explore and compare treatment options. Step three, assess your patient's values and preferences. Step four, reach a decision with your patient. And step five, evaluate your patient's decision. So as I mentioned before, the goal of patient-centered outcomes research is to inform clinical decision-making, and it fits squarely in the shared decision-making model. Step two of the SHARE approach, or help your patient explore and compare treatment options, requires having good evidence-based tools to help you explain and compare options. And here we highlight the effective healthcare program, consumer and clinician research summaries, and patient decision needs that I described earlier. 
As I mentioned before, these resources can help you discuss the benefits and risks of treatment options and understand how they relate to a patient's situation and condition. These resources can also help in understanding how the options compare to one another in terms of benefits and risks. The SHARE approach is presented in a free, one-day train-the-trainer workshop accredited for 10 types of clinicians to encourage integrated care teams uh, to engage patients in SHARE decision-making. The SHARE approach workshop was designed to address the unmet needs of clinicians that we identified in the formative research phase for communication skills to facilitate, uh, to facilitate share decision making and understand um, and understanding how to use evidence-based patient information tools. So the workshop is presented in five modules that address um, in module one, the basic steps to share decision making. In module two, the use of patient-centered outcomes research decision aids to help patients understand their options. Module three addresses communication skills to overcome common barriers to shared decision making, such as low health literacy, low health numeracy, and cultural issues. Module four discusses implementing shared decision making at a team. And module five is how to train others um, in, this, in the share approach. The modular approach can be modified from a single day event to a series of shorter events that can better fit busy clinician schedules. To enhance participant learning and recall, the curriculum employs effective hands-on adult education techniques, including small group discussion, role playing, case studies, use of short videos, and large group discussion. So we are now in the implementation phase of our project. And ARC is sponsoring 10 train-the-trainer workshops per year across the country. We just had our first training session in St. Louis, Missouri at the end of January and have nine more coming out between now and mid-June. Each training can accommodate 25 to 50 individuals, meaning there will be a cadre of about 250 to 500 new share approach trainers created each year. And we're hoping these individuals will then go back to their home organizations to train others. The workshop is accredited at both the primary and secondary level of training so that healthcare professionals can earn continuing education credits for their participation in the training. We think this will help healthcare practices and organizations recruit additional trainees, scale up implementation efforts, and build a team of health professionals committed to shared decision making. On the ARC website, you can find our shared decision making toolkit. I'll provide the link at the end of the presentation. The toolkit also includes all of the workshop modules, including the slides and the training script, nine informational tools that are described and referenced within the training curriculum, a 10-minute video that shows a typical clinical encounter with and without shared decision-making, a screensaver and some posters. We also have a bunch of other links to other ARC resources that support or are related to shared decision-making. Trainer, trainees who participate in the SHARE approach workshop will receive ongoing uh, support from ARC in their, their SHARE decision-making and training efforts. And these include the SHARE approach web conferences. We'll be offering three accredited web conferences a year to support trained workshop participants in implementing SHARE decision-making. Today's web conference is the first, and we are expecting to have additional web conferences in May and July. So Keep an eye out for those announcements as well. And coming soon, ARC will support a forum for trained participants to share their experiences and learn from one another about how things are going from, um, for them during their own implementation efforts. So the project also includes an ongoing evaluation of the implementation of the Share Approach Initiative to better understand who's participating in the training, confidence of primary trainers in training others about the SHARE approach and ARC's PCOR resources, the extent to which workshop participants have been able to conduct additional trainings, um, start new PCOR education programs, and, or integrate the workshop curriculum into their local settings. Um, it will also evaluate partic participation in ongoing web conferences and the learning network 
um, that are planned as part of the effort, and how workshop participants are using what they've learned about peak form shared decision making in their own practice. So as promised, here are the links to find information about both the effective healthcare program and the SHARE approach to SHARE decision making. Please visit effectivehealthcare.arc.gov to find all of the consumer and clinician research summaries, patient decision aids, and of course, the full systematic, um, the full systematic reviews that they're based on. You can also find a number of online continuing education modules on various health conditions on the Effective Healthcare website. Please visit arc.gov slash share decision making to find tools and resources related to the share approach and share decision making. Please note that you can also find out more about the free share approach workshops being held across the country. We currently have three open for registration in Savannah, Georgia, Baltimore, Maryland, and Los Angeles, California, and we expect to have more open for registration soon. So please visit our website to find out about those. Here is my contact information. You may also email us at, the, at share, S-H-A-R-E, at arc.hhs.gov if you'd like to get in touch with our team. And if you would like to receive continuing education credit for today's webinar, please visit this link. And you should also receive an email after today's webinar with this information included. So now we will turn the presentation back over to our esteemed moderator, Dr. Neelay Shaw, for our Q&A. And this slide here outlines how to submit your questions. Dr. Shaw. Yeah, thanks so much, Elena. So I would like to thank all the three uh, presenters, uh, Joanne, um, Victor, and Elena, on great presentations covering sort of the role of shared decision-making in the context of patient-centered medical home and accountable care organizations to actually how it actually happens in the practice to actually opportunities to uh, to learn and get trained in shared decision making to implement it within your own practice so I think it really covers a broad um, broad set of questions so at this point we can take a few um, few questions we have I think at least uh, the next um, 10 minutes or so uh, to to you know take questions that might be um, helpful so you can um, send the qu uh, questions as uh, presented here. So for the moment, I will start um, with one question um, that any of the panelists um, can answer, but maybe we'll start with um, Joanne. Uh, what do you find is the biggest challenge for ACOs or patient-centered medical homes to incorporate uh, shared decision-making in practice? Hi, I would say that having the knowledge of the of the tools, how to use the tools uh, to engage patients in the process, are some uh, components that are are really um, a big challenge. We um, did some research on shared decision making a few years ago. NCQA did, and. Um, Practices were concerned about the cost of um, having um, decision aids in the practice, so they, they were for purchase only at that time. Many of them were. And um, being trained to use them effectively. Um, and then the upkeep, making sure that the information in the decision aids um, continues to be um, accurate and updated. Great, thank you. Um, I don't know if anyone else, uh, either of the other panelists, want to comment on that. Otherwise, we'll go to the next question. So, uh, Victor, this is a question for you. How are patients identified in primary care setting to utilize shared decision-making decision aids? Um, is it automatic, flagged by electronic health records? and how do you document the decision was made? That is a great question that uh, has to deal with the issue of implementing shared decision making in practice. We have, as I mentioned, two projects going on uh, right now where we're trying to sort this out. Um, uh, so far we have relied on making the tools available and uh, clinicians uh, mostly responsible for 
uh, using the tools when they feel that the opportunity has arisen as they interact with patients. Um, in the work of implementing the tools in the electronic workflow, it's amazing how, much, how strong the temptation is to incorporate pop-ups or other kinds of alerts and uh, uh, indications that a decision aid is available for a patient like this, and how many of our IT uh, colleagues want just to provide them with eligibility criteria for triggering those alerts. Um, we are concerned about that because we have seen how um, the practice has uh, become shaped by those alerts and those alarms and how uh, clinicians eventually get tired of them and begin to ignore them. Um, and uh, so we have, this is an open question, and, uh, but one of the things that we're trying to figure out is um, how we might just have the tools available and positioned within the electronic workflow in a place where, uh, and pres present in a place and moment where they might become helpful if somebody were to need them. So they don't have to spend a lot of time looking for them, but once, uh, but that also doesn't, um, that they don't suggest themselves when they may not be necessary. Um, I don't know that we're smart enough to be able to prompt, uh, the, predict exactly, you know, kind of like in the movie Minority Report, when a decision will, is about to take place so that we can predict when to display these tools. The second thing is, of course, documentation, and um, we're working on uh, a process that will be applicable across all major EMR vendors that um, when, so the, the, way the, the way the implementation we're playing with works is you, you create a link uh, in, within the EMR browser. Um, it brings up the, the uh, web-based tool, um, so that way we only have to maintain one tool. Remember, we do this for free, so we have to reduce the cost of maintenance. And uh, so you go to the tool, you, you work through it with the patient in the office during the visit, and then when you exit the tool, that signals to the instance of the EMR that's open that uh, this just finished, and uh, a text is uh, sent in to the EMR to build up a note in which uh, documentation, for instance, of the calculated risk and, the deci and potential decision is uh, facilitated. Um, that bit has proven a little more complicated because different EMRs have different ways of documenting, but uh, that's all work in progress. Great. Thanks so much. Um, this question is for Elena. Um, Elena, this um, question is on what steps are being taken to create an evidence-based foundation for shared decision-making? Um, I'm wondering if how we should if we should clarify that question an evidence based foundation for shared decision making in terms of um, evidence that shows that shared decision making is working. Um, if that's the case, uh, we do um, have a, a new division um, with in, within our evidence for um, evidence based practice um, improvement and. That division is focusing on, um, it will be focusing on shared decision making um, in, in terms of implementation research and looking at measures um, for shared decision making um, to better, uh, to, in, in, to increase, uh, to, I'm sorry, to improve uh, the field there. So, um, but if we're talking about um, building an evidence base uh, for um, for patient decision aids and things like that in the in shared decision making, I think we can point to um, to things like the effective healthcare program, PCORI, et cetera, for resources that can be used in shared decision making. Great, thanks so much. Um, this next question is for Joanne. Joanne, there has been a big focus on patient-centered medical home models and primary care. How fundamental will shared decision-making be in specialty care? It has, in the existing set of standards, it has not been incorporated to the same extent as it has in the medical home standards. However, having said that, NCQA revisits their standards every three years and updates them. So I am anticipating that shared decision making will be increasingly important both in primary care and in specialty care. Great, thank you. Uh, so this next 
question is for Victor. How can shared decision-making overcome the challenges of multiple chronic diseases in a patient, and specifically those patients with co-occurring mental and physical health conditions? Uh, it can't. The, uh, the overcoming the challenges of, of dealing with multimorbidity, whether it's physical or mental, it's actually a much more complicated thing, and uh, just relying on a, one single solution is a, um, a cognitive trap called solutionism in which, uh, you know, I think it may, was made famous by Steve Jobs, you know, where they say, oh, this will change everything. And I don't think shared decision-making is going to change everything. But shared decision-making is potentially an important uh, piece in the uh, uh, series of interventions that could be helpful in uh, reducing the burden of treatment uh, in patients that are overwhelmed and in right-sizing the, um, the care that patients need um, to achieve their goals. Uh, something we're calling minimally disruptive medicine. And in that way, shared decision-making gives voice to the patient and allows us to understand their goals and allows us to understand which, uh, which aspects of the treatment program are consistent with those goals and which aspects of the program, while evidence-based and perhaps indicated by guidelines, are uh, less desirable and can be deprioritized. The end result of that effort will be a program that fits the context of the patient. It, it is respectful of their capacity to um, implement the program and leaves a patient with enough capacity, not just to be a great patient, which of course is no one's goal, but to uh, pursue their life's hopes and dreams. Right, thank you. Um, so this next question I think um, could be for any of the three, uh, maybe either Joanne or Victor could get started. So there are two related questions. One is, any suggestions on getting C-suite to buy in on implementing shared decision-making process in health systems? And in parallel, um, are there any reimbursement strategies or payment strategies to integrate uh, shared decision-making into primary care? I will um, make a few comments and then I, I will turn it over to Victor because what I would say is that some of the research that he cited in his presentation gives good um, ammunition, if you will, for discussions um, underscoring the importance of uh, implementing shared decision-making um, and potential cost um, benefits of, of doing so. Um, and I think that just continuing to um, look at data that will support this um, really will advance the shared decision-making in, into the medical home model. Victor? Um, the, um, the question about payment models is one, of cons one that concerns me because, as I mentioned earlier, for us, the idea of shared decision making is um, is a, a, a integral part of uh, clinical care. It's a uh, uh, it's a hallmark of professionalism and a, uh, a hallmark of patient centered care. And there's a nasty habit of um, of bringing um, payment uh, issues uh, like pay for performance, for instance, into the um, um, uh, adoption of uh, things like shared decision making that then could potentially lead to corruption in the practice. So, for instance, we may believe that shared decision making ought to reduce healthcare utilization and costs. And um, if patients begin to think that that's the reason we are pulling out a decision aid to discuss with them, then uh, the uh, trust in the whole enterprise will um, succumb. So, I think we have to be careful not to offer patients an alternative explanation for why we're doing shared decision making. Uh, we're essentially doing it to make sure that the care that we provide is consistent with their with their goals, their vision uh, for their own uh, health and life. And it's not for us to get paid more, and it's not for the healthcare system to save money. Um, I think if, if there are economic benefits of shared decision-making, those would be welcome and downstream consequences. But I'm worried that sometimes um, using incentives like money to uh, make a practices that should be integral to providing health care um, uh, distorts that practice. Finally, the, the, the usual ex uh, reason why people want to be paid extra for doing shared decision making is that there are competing priorities for their time and effort. And in order to prioritize properly, they would like the, the, you know, to go where the money is. I find that offensive uh, to the uh, professionalism of those at the front line. 
and, uh, but I also find it effective. And, um, and so then the problem is that when you stop paying or incentive for shared decision making, the practice will be turned off and it will only be turned on back again uh, with the only argument that now people will listen to, which is the argument of money for it. So I'm, I'm very concerned about the use of incentives and the use of external uh, rewards when in the, um, the joy, uh, one of the things I didn't share with you is that we video record every visit in which we do, when we do our studies. And if you watch these videos, the um, one thing that we haven't been able to quantify yet, but it's present uh, very consistently, is an enormous amount of joy in the connection that occurs between patients and clinicians when they're sharing decisions. And that joy of practice in, a, in an environment in which clinicians have an, uh, are suffering through an epidemic of burnout and, and in chronic disease, which uh, is often fraught with frustration, uh, is something to pay attention to. And I'm worried that um, we can take this joy and eliminate it by making it part of an economic transaction. Great. Thank you so much, Victor. Um, unfortunately, we have um, reached the end of our uh, webinar. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending the webinar. We'll do our best to get back to you with any questions or feel free to email um, directly um, where emails have been available both for Elena and um, Victor and I think Joanne as well uh, for any um, questions that remain unanswered. Again, thank you so much for joining and thank you to all the presenters.